day to my fellow poetry enthusiasts and welcome to our analysis of a person is a person because of other people. Please note that the English translation of the title of this poem will be used throughout for the purpose of simplification. And here is our poet of the day, Jeremy Cronin. Here he can be seen at a recent political gathering speaking on behalf of his party, the African National Congress. Down here I've included some basic information about his life. Now, in his adolescence, Curran considered entering priesthood. Fortunately for our literary minds, he decided against that. Following a year in the military, Curran won a bursary to study at the University of Cape Town, where he was subsequently recruited into the South African Communist Party. Curran's activism and spreading of anti-apartheid propaganda led to a seven-year prison sentencing. His wife, Anne-Marie, died of a brain tumour during his imprisonment. Thus, I guess it's easy to see why he reaches deep into his prison experience in the writing of his poetry. And we'll find that as we inspect a person is a person because of other people. Let's kick things off right away by dissecting our title. A person is a person because of other people. Standing poignantly in the language of Setswana. Now, this is based on the African philosophy of Ubuntu. This is about togetherness. This is about how we frame our identity through those around us. It's about how our world can only be fulfilled by the being of others around us. And this is a very important concept when it comes to the resistance, because the support and the interdependence of those in the resistance was key to obviously coming through that. It's, it's something very similar to the concept of it takes a village to raise a child. It's all about human solidarity. Moving on to our very first line. By holding my mirror out of the window, I see. He already speaks of my mirror. It's a very possessive pronoun. This is obviously because the prisoner has very few possessions, so therefore the mirror is quite important to this prisoner. Of course, in this case, he's also using it for a very key purpose, and that is this idea of communication. So it's more than just a mirror to him. In the usual case, a mirror is used to reflect on oneself, but here it's allowing him to reflect on the outside, on the outside of his cell, that is, to another prisoner. So the mirror is the very first form of symbolism that we come across because it's more than a mirror, it's a form of communication. Out of the window. Now window, isn't that quite an ironic word to use? I'm gonna I'm gonna mark out all our parts of speech in red if you don't mind. That is irony because a window usually provides a view, an outlet to the outside. But here they cannot see the world outside, and instead, instead, it's only allowing them to see the passage of their cell. It's almost as if freedom is eluding them. Clear to the end of the passage, so you can see, he says it's clear. So he's, he's simply meaning they're able now to communicate. That there's no obstruction, the warder is not in sight. Moving on then. There's a person down there. I want you to take note of the use of the word person. Person. It's very vague. A prisoner polishing a door handle. Now we get the word prisoner. So first we first he's called a person and then a prisoner. So that draws our attention to the fact that this man is, is a human first. He's got human dignity. And then he's a prisoner. He's not defined by the status of being a prisoner. Also, you must remember he's using a very small mirror to, to communicate. So it might have taken a few seconds for our speaker to register that the person who was being seen in that mirror was a fellow prisoner. Now, what we see here is that he's slightly different from the prisoner who is polishing the door handle. This man who is able to polish the door handle obviously was a less serious offender because uh, he was allowed to perform this menial chore, if you will. 
So this menial chore of polishing the door handle was quite symbolic of their subservience. But this is mainly an outward subservience, and that's something we'll witness as we go along in this poem. Another form of irony is one we see right here with the use of the word door handle. Because doors are usually something that separates us from, from freedom. It's a, it's a stepping stone, it's a gateway into something else. And here we, he's right at the door handle. However, he can't turn it to, and leave. He has to simply clean it. So this emphasizes that they are trapped in the prison because of unjust laws. Moving on then. In the mirror, I see him see. My face in the mirror. So again, this is illustrating to us how the mirror is being used as a tool of communication in this oppressive situation. I see the fingertips of his free hand. Now again, a bit of irony, and we're just going to underline it this time with the free hand, because they're definitely not free. But you can see that they, they find their methods of freeing themselves through communication. Bunch together as if to make an object the size of a badge. Now, a badge is, is, is usually a symbol of authority or, or a position, which travels up to his forehead, the place of an imaginary cap. So now this completes that. Uh, the badge image with the cap show us that it's someone of authority that's approaching. He's trying to signal his fellow prison mate, that there is someone in their presence. It's not clear as they had hoped or they had believed. And this form of communication with the hand signals proves that the prisoners were not completely subservient. They shared a common bond and they had this common language. And now this common language is being translated for us right here on this right-hand side so our main narrative is, is right here on the left, and on the right-hand side, in parentheses, we find a translation for us. This means a warder. So now we're aware that this badge and this cap and this hand signal was all meant to represent to the fellow prisoner that a warder was approaching. Let's head straight on then, shall we? Two fingers are extended in a V and wiggle like two antennae. So here we get our very first simile of the poem coming through, of course, indicated by the word like right over there. And what we see here is that his fingers are extended in a V and the fingers are being compared to antennae. This gives us a clear mental image of how the man is moving his fingers and it proves to be very useful for communication just as the antennae are and this this indicates to the reader now that they've de developed their own sign language to indicate what's going on and we see right here he's being watched that the antennae the the v symbol with the fingers indicate that he's being watched a finger of his free hand makes a watch hands arc now, the irony of free hand is not lost on me once more. This comes through as repetition from line six. Now, just as the hand of a watch moves in a particular direction at a particular rate, so too are the movements of the prisoners confined and controlled. So we see that similarity in method. On the wrist of his polishing arm, without disrupting the slow, slow rhythm of his work. So now we see that his hand gestures are making a suggestion that he'll only be able to speak later. And we understand that, of course, by referring to our parentheses for the translation. The slow, slow. That's a very drawn out word. You can even hear the effect it has on the rhythm. It's slow. It's really ensuring you have to round your mouth out to make that sound and it deliberately slows down the sentence as well. 
Now, this indicates to us that there was no enthusiasm going into this work, of course, as you would understand. And he works deliberately slowly because this allows him a little more time out in that area where he's performing the chore so that he can communicate with more people around him. So it's a deliberate slowing down. This menial task does not provide him with any joy. He's not doing the work willingly. So it's a small act of rebellion in a way as well, going more slowly. But more importantly, it provides him with an opportunity to communicate with the other prisoners and to convey the messages that he so wishes. Moving on then, we're on to line 19 now. Hey, what mark a dar? A voice from around the corner. Now all of a sudden we see a change in tone because we've got italics right here. We didn't have that before and also a different language. So it seems as if something's happening all of a sudden and it's quite significant. Here we see the language of Afrikaans. Now that was the language of the oppressor. Apartheid was introduced by the Afrikaners and this authoritative tone conveys a sense of control that this guard will be able to practice over the prisoner. Of course, this is all explained to us what's going on with the translation on the right-hand side. We know that someone is approaching because of this translation. No, just polishing bars. Now you can see this form of interaction, this direct speech is also in italics. And he says simply that he's just continuing with the work. This is very subservient. It's a meek tone. I've marked out the tones that we've recently encountered in this exchange, just to show how they've really been juxtaposed against each other, the authoritative and the meek. Very opposing styles. And going back to that sentence, just polishing bars. We see that it's quite subservient, He's trying to dispel any suspicions on the part of the guard. And you'll see that he names him Bas because that proves, you know, you're in a position of power and I'm below you. It's, 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 it's the dynamic of these two individuals. The Notice, however, that the word Bas is not capitalized. So as much as he is doing what's necessary and referring to him by the accurate titles, he's not really showing respect. Because whereas the guards may have control over the prisoners in terms of physical movement, they had no control over the minds of the prisoners. He turns his back to me, now watch. His free hand, the talkative one. Once more we encounter the free hand, and at this point it's a very familiar symbol to us. Here we see, however, for the first time, the talkative one, a new descriptor for it, and that is a very accurate personification, because this hand has been used very effectively to communicate, as if it were able to talk. The hand is, of course, their only means of communication. The, the communication reassures the narrator that he's not alone. So there's a sense of unity and solidarity. It's not just the isolation of the prison cell. Slips quietly behind. So the movement of the hand is discreet. It's not noticed by the guard. Strength, brother, it says. Again, we're given that insight into what he's thinking and saying. And it's a very strong message. It's, it's encouraging the prisoner to be patient, not to lose hope. He conveys a message of perseverance. It's, it's reassuring that we are together. We are together in this. And we will strive and come out of this together. And then it says, in my mirror. A black fist. In my mirror, so everyone again sees what's happening. It's the communication. A black fist symbolizes freedom. There's defiance there. There's pride. Again, 
that symbol of Ubuntu comes through. So I'm just going to pin it down once more. Ubuntu. Even though they are oppressed, they will not be discouraged. They will continue this fight for freedom. It also relates once more to, to that pride they have as prisoners. They're not just prisoners. They're more than that. This power in their solidarity, this power with the people, a mandla, a wetu. That's a very popular African phrase, if you will. So it's a very silent but powerful symbol. This raised fist is now a very famous symbol to us. We will obviously know this now as, as the readers. It's now a very popular symbol. But of course, this is showing how it was used during the apartheid regime. It was a direct defiance of the white government. It survived all this time to become now commonly associated with black nationalism and sometimes socialism, a cause which was very important to the poet. In totality, this shows up to us the victory of human connection across prison cell and colour lines. The spirit of Ubuntu, this human spirit, can be reached even in difficult situations. Now a quick look at the finer details. As we know, parentheses are used when the poet is explaining the meaning of the hand gestures, and this is a way to translate the physical to the verbal. It's quite effective because it contains information that the guard or any other observer would not have, and we as the reader, however, do have access to that. So in, in ways, it's a form of dramatic irony if you wish to go that far. However, this format of translation is varied as the pro poem progresses. So initially, we do get that insertion with the parentheses coming through in line 14, sorry, in line 11, that is, and then coming through line 14 and, and line 18, we get the explanation more directly, and then at the end, the insertions lose their brackets altogether, because now this almost seems as if the reader has begun to understand the poem's language and no longer needs that direct translation. So that's quite interesting. Noted an irregular rhyme scheme, perhaps that was to reflect human speech, uh, although this being mainly wordless, but uh, it is a way of communication, so I guess this irregular rhyme scheme does does go with convention in terms of speech. Looking at tone, I've, I've included sardonic, because it's, it, it re they really do mock the principle of imprisonment, the restriction of personal freedom. They do mock that in their communications. And I've included that the mood is quite hopeful, because there's this power in their unification. Additionally, there's the use of different languages throughout this poem. So Cronin uses the different languages to show this connection between the different people in the prison. The use of sign language shows the communication between the prisoners. The Setswana highlights the idea that people are connected together, all of us, that's the word Ubuntu, of, of course. And then the prison guard's use of Afrikaans speaks directly to authority there's most certainly power in language. Afrikaans shows us the power of the oppressors. The subversive power of the prisoners comes through in their sign language and their effective communication. And the poem is narrated in English, which is the power of the poet. Of course, the unification of our people that comes through in Ubuntu, that would be the African language of Setswana. Of course, with this communication, the handheld mirror is a very apt metaphor for how increasingly common it is for people today to look at life quite indirectly. And finally, the black fist, the iconic black fist, seems to take on a language all on its own because it's so popular, it's so widely understood as a very strong, powerful, unifying symbol of strength. That's all for this time, folks, and we'll see you next time.